Our reading for today is an excerpt from the poem Coniferous Fathers by Michael Kleber Diggs. Let's grow fathers from pine, not oak, coniferous fathers, raising us in their shade, fathers soft enough to bend, fathers who love us like their fathers couldn't, fathers who can talk about menstruation while playing a game of pepper in the front yard. No, take baseball out. Let's discover a new sport. Fathers as varied and vast as the superior forest. Let's kill off sternness and play down wisdom. Give us fathers of laughter and fathers who cry. Fathers who say, check this out, or I'm scared or I'm sorry, or I don't know. Give us fathers strong enough to admit they want to be near us, that they've always wanted to be near us. Give us fathers desperate for something different, not Johnny Appleseed, not even Atticus Finch. No more rolling stones, no more lazy boy dads reading newspapers in some other room. Let's create folklore side by side in a garden singing psalms about abiding. Just that, abiding. Being steadfast, present, evergreen, and ethereal. Let's make the old needles soft enough for us to rest on, dream on, next to them. So ends the reading. When I was growing up, it was common for boys to insult each other by critiquing each other's masculinities. I was subject to a lot of this. I was unathletic and not particularly interested in sports, more prone to sadness than anger, and what you might call nerdy. That hasn't changed much, admittedly. These traits had a whole host of implications in the minds of my classmates about my gender, my sexuality, and my physiology, which they felt compelled to share with me. <laughs> there's an academic term for this, gender essentialism. It means there's only one right way to be a man or a woman. To the gender essentialist, man, male, and masculine are all inextricably knotted together, as are their gendered mirror. It is heteronormative, it lacks the nuance needed for intersex people, and either does not acknowledge or treats with extreme disdain transgender, genderqueer, and non-binary people. It is insidious, and traces of it can be found nearly everywhere, such as in colloquialisms like man up, and in the prevalence of so-called locker room talk. And it is an integral part of toxic masculinity. Feminism, our current topic, amongst its many functions, provides a critique of gender essentialism. It seeks to untangle those knots of biology, identity, and behavior. Feminism is a necessary deconstructive force. And as the calendar in the UUCA office says, feminism is for everyone, quoting bell hooks. Deconstruction, however, is not the final step in any process. You see, we need foundations to undergird our understandings of the world. Pastor Rob Bell speaks of two types of worldview, the brick wall and the trampoline. If you knock out too many bricks from the brick wall worldview, the whole thing crumbles. With a trampoline, you can remove some springs that have rusted out or aren't doing you any good anymore while you look for new ones to replace them and it still functions. The traits of toxic masculinity, like violence, disregard for consent, 
egotism, and emotional stunting have always been with us. Our drawing attention to these traits, knocking out those bricks, has made the whole wall crumble, leaving many men to try and rebuild with the shattered pieces, and sometimes the only thing they can find are the very worst parts of our culture of masculinity. To quote Natalie Wynne, a public philosopher and YouTuber, we tell men that they are broken without really telling them how to fix themselves. The very ideas of masculinity and femininity are themselves a tangle of interrelated concepts. Natalie, whom I just quoted, is a trans woman. And she speaks often in her videos about the need to perform gender and how she engages in it so that other people will affirm her womanhood. Compare that with my friend, a lesbian, who has told me that though she is a woman, she identifies more with masculine traits and behavior. And then there are people who I mentioned earlier who neither identify as man or woman. I am a straight, cisgender man who gravitates towards typically feminine work, first social work and now pastoral care. Regardless of how we identify, we all still use feminine and masculine as descriptors that both define and transcend our understandings of gender and sex. I've been looking for a long time for a definition of masculinity that I felt included me. Because I come out of Christianity, I started with Jesus. And somewhere along the way, I encountered this quote from Father Richard Rohr, a Catholic priest who runs the Center for Action and Contemplation in New Mexico. Jesus had a male body, but a feminine soul. The first time I read this, folks, I had a very strong reaction. It felt like something was ripped away from me. But I admire Rohr with his progressive theology and his universalism, so I kept listening. I learned that his statement comes out of his Trinitarian theology. Apologies. His, brief, his belief that what Christians call the Holy Spirit is the feminine expression of God. And I think this is important for two reasons. The first is that so much harm has been done by the exclusive masculinizing of God, and that just needs to be named. Thank you. The second is that this illustrates a critical aspect of spirituality and the reconstruction of our ideas. Paradox. So I, I believe in the idea of Imago Dei, that we are made in the image of the divine. And to me, that divine contains the best of the masculine and the feminine. And if I am made in that image, then I contain the best of the masculine and the feminine within me, and so do all of you. And we've lost this somehow. Historically, balance and integration of the masculine and the feminine have been identified with health and spirituality. And this is around the world. Think of yin and yang from Taoism. Think of anima and animus in Jungian psychology. There's even an entire room at the Carlos Museum at Emory dedicated to the shaman in Central American traditions who was thought to embody both feminine and masculine spirits. The paradox is that masculinity and femininity can only be understood in relation to one another. Toxic masculinity shuns all things it perceives as feminine which only serves to make it weaker and more fragile. This is why feminism really is for everyone, because it makes the case that your gender or your sex or your presentation need not dictate the other dimensions of your life. That knot is untangled. No one has a claim to either masculinity or femininity. Rather, we all have a claim to both. 
but I still haven't defined masculinity. Now, we can name parts of our culture that um, are parts of it that are culturally bound easily enough, and I think we should uphold those things, at least the good ones and the neutral ones, and a lot of it is just neutral. It functions as a kind of balm against toxic masculinity, which is grasping for something to hold on to, to make an identity out of. My beard, or my love of flannel or chopping wood, have no moral weight. <laughs> Honestly, that might have more to do with my identity as a New Englander than anything. <laughs> They're not necessary to masculinity. They just exist, culturally bound. So long as we don't insist on them, I don't think they do us any harm. If I tell you, you have to like chopping wood to be a man, that's a problem. If I say, I like chopping wood, it makes me feel masculine, that's fine. There's springs in my trampoline, and I might replace them later. But you see, I'm interested in a kind of primordial masculinity. And to find that, I think we have to start with femininity, which I feel is the better defined of the two. It has long been understood as the force of nurturance, other love and affirmation. Masculinity must be its complement, not the opposite as it is so often thought and so often taught in toxic masculine spaces. I believe masculinity at the primordial level is a fundamental force of self-care, self-love, and self-confidence. And these both belong to all people. But we are typically socialized into one at the expense of the other. Toxicity is either of these without their counterbalance. Our initial, wall, uh, our initial model, be it wall or trampoline, is learned from the adults in our lives. Hopefully, we learn from the feminine forces in our lives that we are loved and have worth. Internalizing this creates the masculine belief in our own value. Meanwhile, masculine forces model skills that help us flourish teaching us to fill our wells so that we may express feminine care of others. Notice I said masculine forces and feminine forces, not men and women, and that is a critical distinction. Both of these, when healthy, have some of the other in it. We can find value for ourselves in performing acts of care. We can express care through teaching and fostering independence. Think of a time when you have acted out a healthy masculinity or femininity, and I especially encourage you to think of the complementary trait to the one you feel more inclined towards or socialized into. Take hold of that and celebrate it. Model it. You never know who in your life might need to see that balance affirmed in you. Men need that. We all do. But the toxic impulse towards total independence, fostered in so many men, runs counter to the self-care which I believe is part of healthy masculinity. We are meant to hold one another and let ourselves be held and upheld. Feminine in the midst of and in balance with the masculine. It makes me think of Sam and Frodo at the end of The Lord of the Rings, the climax at the slopes of Mount Doom. If you don't know the story, Sam starts as Frodo's gardener. He sees his role as his caretaker in all regards, functioning as the feminine force in Frodo's archetypically masculine hero's journey. When Frodo collapses from the weight of his burden, the ring around his neck, Sam says, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. Tolkien would later say that Sam 
was the true hero of the Lord of the Rings. It has become something of a trend to read romance into that relationship. And if you do that, that's totally fine, especially if it allows you to see yourself better in that story. But I see their relationship as a deep, intimate friendship. And it frustrates me that we constantly conflate intimacy and sexuality, insisting that their love for each other can only be read sexually is itself a kind of harm, not that unlike what was done by my classmates. We must learn to normalize vulnerability, empathy, and connection between all people, be they men or people of any gender, in all its many healthy forms. In closing, I want to tell you briefly about how my parents have lived into this paradox in my life. I really struggled when deciding to move and attend school here 1,100 miles away from where I grew up. I've always been a bit of a homebody, and the thought of moving far away ate at me. I see this now as actually a deficit in my own masculine energy. When I spoke with my father about the decision, he said to me, I will miss you, but you need to do what's best for you. A drop of the feminine in his model of masculinity. Likewise, my mother, when we talk on the phone, never fails to say, I wish you were here right now with me, but often adds in, I'm so proud of you. A drop of the masculine in her feminine care. May we all be so blessed, and may we all be such a blessing. Thank you.